Okay, welcome back after the break. Uh, just before we went for our break, uh, we looked at, we, I read uh, uh, Jackin's question. Okay, Jesus showed himself after his resurrection to Mary Magdalene and other disciples. So where they actually able to see Jesus in his glory in one instance, he he told them, uh, told her not to touch him, but we see that he still ate with the disciples. So how was Jesus different in appearance before and after his um, resurrection? Now, according to the Bible, uh, we see that after resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples and uh, he also instructed, uh, you know, Mary Magdalene not to touch him because he has not yet ascended to the Father. We read this in, um, in John chapter 20, verse 17. Now, there are different interpretations um, for why Jesus told Mary Magdalene not to touch him is that one interpretation is basically they say that you know Jesus wanted to emphasize the spiritual nature of his uh, resurrection and in fact that he is no longer bound by physical uh, limitations and the other is that he did not want Mary Magdalene uh, you know to to cling on to him, to hold on to him and not let him uh, go okay so here actually um, the confusion uh, is regarding what Jesus meant, mostly owing to the phrase in the older King James Version that says, touch me not. Uh, so some, some think that, you know, Jesus told Mary not to touch him in any way, uh, so, so that, you know, his contact with her would somehow defile him. But, uh, you know, that is not what is probably meant by what some uh, theologians or commentary writers say but we need to actually look at it in the greek word and you know in the greek tense in the in a very uh, the you know greek words have different tense and so we have to study the greek words in its different tense present tense past tense present future etc etc so here it is actually the Greek word is the present imperative uh, with a negative means, you know, when the negative meaning is stop doing something uh, rather than don't do something. OK, so basically what Jesus was saying is, you know, uh, not that Mary, you don't hold on to me that I will be defiled. But, you know, he's saying don't hold on to me in the sense, you know, don't keep me detained here. Don't hold on to me that, you know, I keep pure I have to meet others I have to I have other things to do and then don't hold on to me for dear life means you know now you need I have resurrected you know there's the Holy Spirit who I'm going to give who's going to come and minister to you so just don't hold on um, to me in that sense so um, and also, yes, Jesus' resurrected body was different. Uh, we look at how it is different, uh, but yet, you know, it had some similarities uh, to his pre-resurrection body. And, uh, you know, so there is some similarities that are there, but the whole aspect of why he told her not to hold on uh, to him was, you know, uh, he didn't want to be detained there or held on um, with Mary. He had other things that he, you know, had to do. And also that, you know, he wanted to tell Mary that, you know, uh, don't uh, keep, you know, like a master, like a shepherd, just holding on. But, you know, uh, you need to go on with life. There is the Holy Spirit who's going to come and who's going to help you. Okay. And it's also true that uh, two of uh, Jesus' disciples did not recognize him uh, when he walked with him on the road to Emmaus. Uh, that is Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 22. But Luke specifically mentions there and tells us this was because their eyes were kept from recognizing him okay luke 24 verse 16 and later when luke says mentions that their eyes were opened they recognized him which he writes about it in the same chapter luke chapter 24 verse 31 now mary magdalene failed to recognize uh, jesus only for a moment that is in john chapter 20 verses 14 to 16 but uh, it it could have been because it was still very dark 
and also she was looking for uh, Jesus when she had come first time and it was still dark as it says in John chapter 20 verse 1 but when she turned to speak uh, to Jesus at once she recognized him we look at this in John chapter 20 verse 16 now in other occasions you know the disciples seem to recognize Jesus very very quickly Matthew chapter 28 verse 9 verse 17 John chapter 20 verses 19 to 20 uh, 26 to 28 uh, John chapter 21 verses 7 and and 12 we see on these occasions the disciples quickly recognized uh, Jesus so when Jesus appeared to the 11 disciples in Jerusalem you know they were initially startled they were frightened we read about this in Luke chapter 24 verses 33 and 37 but yet when they touched Jesus's hands and his feet you know and when they watched him eat the piece of fish uh, they were convinced that this was Jesus and that he in fact rose from the uh, dead. So all of these instances uh, are examples that indicate that you know, there was a considerable uh, degree of continuity between the physical appearance of Jesus before, uh, you know, after his death and his resurrection. So there was a physical continuity because the way he looked uh, he also had the scars on his hand and his feet now why uh, okay I'll come to that okay so in fact uh, Jesus had a physical body which could be touched which could be handled after the resurrection um, you know as seen by the disciples because they took hold of his feet we read this in Matthew chapter 28, verse 9, and that he appeared to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Uh, he walked and traveled along with them just like any other traveler on the road, Luke chapter 24. Uh, he took bread and he broke it, Luke chapter 24, verse 30. He ate a piece of um, uh, fish, which demonstrates to us very clearly that Jesus had a physical body after his resurrection and he was not just a spirit uh, being but Mary taught him to be a gardener in John chapter 20 verse 15 she could not recognize Jesus she thought he was a gardener but when he showed her his hands and his feet the same chapter in verse 20 uh, and then he invited Thomas to touch his hand and his feet and his side, John chapter 20, verse 27. And he appeared to his disciples on the sh in the Sea of Tiberias, John chapter 21. So all of this we, you know, explicitly or we just clearly see that, you know, Jesus was perfectly him, that he had this human body. They touched his hand, his feet. Uh, they handled him. And we, uh, in Luke chapter 24, verse 39, Jesus says, you know, look at me, see me, for a spirit has no flesh and bones as you see that I have. Okay, if you look at Luke chapter 24, verse 39, Jesus says, hey, I'm not a spirit being. I'm flesh and bones and body because you've touched me and you've seen me, you know, uh, and I'm not like a spirit being with no flesh and uh, bones this is, what, this is what jesus said in luke chapter 24 verse uh, 39 and peter and the disciples ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead acts chapter 10 verse 41 which you know uh, peter testifies to that fact so all these examples basically indicate uh, to us that you know there was a considerable you know continuity between the physical appearance of jesus before his death and after his um, resurrection. Yet, even though we say that he had, there was a physical continuity, he had this physical body, but just like I said in the beginning of the class, it was a more transformed body. It was not the same body which he had as before his death, which was subject to aging, weaknesses, and eventually death, but there was a transformation in the sense that you know he put on immortality a body that was put on uh, became from mortal to immortal first corinthians chapter 15 verse 53 we also say that paul says the, the resurrection body is raised imperishable with power in glory and a spiritual body first corinthians chapter 15 verse 42 to 
44. So even though he had the same kind of a physical body, but it was a transformed physical body that each one of us will also have, which will be raised imperishable with power in glory. Where is uh, Prince? In glory, in power, and a spiritual um, body. Okay, so it was not subject to weakening, aging, or to eternal uh, death. So Jacken's question, uh, the other part is, you know, was uh, so were they actually able to see Jesus in his glory? No, because only Jesus says in his uh, in his prayer in John chapter 17, Father, when I come to you, give me back the glory. He had not yet ascended back to the Father. So from what we see from scripture, what we can interpret, uh, you know, he's not yet gone back to the Father. So he's not yet received the glory of deity. If he had the glory of deity in his in his resurrected body, then none of his uh, disciples could see him. He could not eat with them. They could not even uh, touch him. Okay. So did that help, Jackin? Anyone has any other questions based on this? Thank you, Jackin. Yes, Lynn. Uh, so, Pastor, uh, so Jesus was not in his glorified body when he uh, resurrected and showed himself to the disciples. It was a transformed physical body, but he had not yet received his glory because he had not yet ascended to the Father. So it would be the same thing for us if we resurrected or rose from the dead. We will have the imperishable body. Yeah. We're not subject to any weakness, aging. Yeah, spiritual bodies. So we, uh, we can't have the glory of deity, right? We are not yeah, deity. Yeah, yeah. We can't have the glory of deity. But uh, we would have glorified bodies. Yes, we will have glorified bodies. Glorified bodies means it will not be like these bodies that are perishable, subject to weakness and aging. That is what we talk about glorified bodies. Okay. Yes. Any other questions? No? If not, uh, we will move on to... Yes, Sean, can you please take the mic and speak into it, please? Uh, Ma'am, uh, when you talk about uh, Jesus and Thomas, when Jesus, when Thomas said, I won't believe unless I touch him, mm -hmm. so wasn't that time like uh, mostly for uh, Thomas to know if Jesus was real or not? And in the I, sense, can't, I can't uh, no? understand what you're saying, sorry. Uh, I'm talking about uh, Jesus. Thomas, was, uh, Thomas uh, touching yeah. Jesus' side and the son, yes. At that time, wasn't it because uh, Thomas didn't believe that Jesus was uh, Jesus came to disciples? Yes. Yeah. So, Thomas then, did not believe. That is why Jesus tells him. Yeah. So wasn't wasn't the point of uh, then later on he said that do you not do you believe because you see me? How happy are those who believe without seeing me? So, How blessed are those who yeah. without seeing believe? Yes. So at that point, wasn't it more like a point or a statement he's making uh, to Thomas? Yes. And also, it's it's something that we can rejoice in that we can we we don't see the the body of Jesus. We can't touch him, see him, but yet we believe. So, okay, yeah, there's the hope for us that we are in the right place. Yes, okay. I've, what I missed out saying was that you know uh, why did Jesus in his in his glorified body? I mean, his resurrected body that is. Like the glorified body, why did he have scars that pierced the, the, the spear that pierced his side? There was, you know, you know, that scar that was made, his the nail pierced hands, his feet. Why were the scars still there? Literally a hole, right? If it has to go through and come out and be held on, it has to be like a, a deep hole. So why was the scar still there? Yes, actually, it was Jesus who chose to keep it as a proof of his work for us. Why he did that is we don't know, but he chose to do that, which means do we will we when in our glorified body have scars, mental scars, emotional scars that we go through in life, accident scars, 
you know, will we have that or will we, you know, if we lose a hand or a limb or a leg or something when uh, when we were living on this earth, in when we are resurrected, we will we will not have that hand or leg? No. No, we will raise, we will raise perfect, okay, without any scars. But why did Jesus have those scars? Because he chose to have those scars. Uh, Ma'am, actually, most people sometimes, well, what happens is, especially when you look at the people in the army, like when they get scars or something, most of them are usually proud of that because they know that when they look back on the scars, they know that what they fought for, you know, they, they risked their life for something, you know, it's like a good reminder for them. Even though something they got out of pain is a good reminder that, you know, I earned this. Maybe the same, it's the same thing for Jesus that he's, uh, he's done this, he's died for us on the cross. I don't think Jesus needed that thing to prove that, hey, I have fulfilled the work, I have done the work. It was not for himself, it was, it would be for us. It would be for us that what he has done. So, yeah. Thank uh, you, Sean. The reason I say this is because when uh, God made a covenant with Noah, he said he'll, uh, he'll make a, a rainbow in order to show that he's keeping his covenant. So that's why I said that. That is for man. Yes. Yeah. He doesn't need to show that, you know, he's he needs something to remind himself of the covenant. But yes, it's for yeah. man. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. So we were looking, before we went for the break, we were looking at the doctrinal significance of the resurrection. Uh, Christ's resurrection ensures our regeneration, uh, means we're talking about new life. We also saw uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. Paul connects the resurrection of Christ with the spiritual work or spiritual power that is at work um, within us. So here in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 to 20, Paul says by, that by power, the power that God used to raise Jesus back from death to life is the same power that is at work within us. So Paul further sees us raised in Christ when he says, you know, in uh, Romans chapter 6 verses 4 to 11, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life, so you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive in God in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 6 verses 4 and 11. So this new resurrection identity that we have, the spiritual identity that we have in Christ includes the power in us, gives us the power uh, to gain more and more victory over overcoming sin, uh, the power of sin, the dominion of sin in our body like Paul says in Romans chapter 6 verse 4 and 11 and also in verse uh, 14 of Romans chapter 6 where he says you know we have the power uh, to and the, uh, to gain victory more and more victory over remaining sins in our life so yes the power of sin is not completely broken over our lives but Christ has finished the work on the cross and his resurrection is a proof that what he did on the cross is a complete, you know, full, sufficient, complete thing. And God the Father was satisfied with Christ's work on the cross. Like I said last class, I explained last class, that is the whole significance of resurrection. The very fact that Christ resurrected from the dead, God caused Jesus to raise up from the dead was because he was satisfied with the prize or the penalty or the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for our sins. Christ, uh, God the Father, was satisfied with this, the atonement of sin. He was satisfied with the payment of sin. The penalty of sin was paid fully. And Christ sacrificed, made that full, sufficient, and perfect sacrifice. And because he was satisfied with what Christ has done. He resurrected him back from death to life in an imperishable, glorious body. Okay, so Christ's resurrection gives us new life in our spirit man. It also gives us the power, okay, the same power that raised Jesus back from death to life, the same power that is working in us to do signs, miracles, and wonders. And not only that, 
also the same power that is working in us to overcome uh, sin, the dominion of sin, the power of sin, and to gain more and more uh, victory uh, over the remaining sins in our life. Because Paul says this in Romans chapter 6, verse 4, verse 11, verse 14, where he says, sin will have no dominion over you. Why will sin have no dominion over you? Because Christ resurrected from the dead and when he resurrected from the dead his resurrection power is at working in us is powerfully working in us and gives us the power to gain more and more victory over the remaining sin in our life look at what romans chapter 6 verse 6 and verse 7 says can one of you please read loudly romans chapter 6 verse 6 and verse 7 please Romans chapter 6 verse 6 knowing this that our old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves of sin verse 7 for he who has died for us has been freed from sin okay that's enough amen thank you so Paul says that the old man was crucified with Christ, which means our old sinful nature was nailed on the cross. Jesus took it upon himself when he was crucified on the cross. That is, the old man is talking about the old Adamic nature, our old sinful nature that was in our spirit man was crucified on the cross. So the human spirit, our human spirit has a nature. Okay, so before we are born again, our human spirit had what kind of nature? Adamic nature, sinful nature, the old man nature. So, uh, but when we are born again, we are born again uh, into the life of Christ, which means we have the, the life of Christ in, the new life of Christ, which he purchased for us on the cross in our spirit man so when we say our spirit man has a nature we are basically talking or when we are saying that the nature of the old man or the nature of the new man we are basically meaning who we are in our heart in our soul our very core being our very essence of our character who we are in our old nature the old man the very essence of our nature the very essence of our character was to yield to sin sinful nature but when we are born again we are born again in our spirit man so our spirit man has the nature and the life of christ which means has the nature and life of christ means has a nature not to yield to sin to overcome sin and to overpower sin so the nature of the born again human spirit is referred to as the new man so don't think okay hey man i have the bible says you know i'm a born again i'm a new creation i'm a new man but why i have these tendencies to go back to my old sinful nature it's basically talking about born again in a spirit man so when a spirit is yielding continually to the holy spirit then we will be renewed in our in our souls okay in our uh, in our in our in our mind in our emotions and in our uh, body so the nature of the new man has the tendency or inclination not to yield to sin but to live a holy and righteous life so that is why there is always a tug of war happening in yourself right there's a big tug of war you know what's a tug of war right you know we, in sports day you have this rope one group decide one group and this pulling the one side is winning sometimes other side is winning sometimes so there is also always a tug of war and your sinful nature your cravings of your physical body your mind your emotions want you to do something the spirit wants you to do something else okay so there is always a sun but we always have to listen to our spirit man and yield to our spirit man okay so for the believer the old man has been brought to an end old man has been to brought to an end means in our spirit being our old nature has been brought to an 
end, the old man is destroyed, the body of sin, which is representing the power of sin, the dominion of sin, uh, the nature of sin is done away with, it's destroyed, it's nullified, it's rendered as inoperative in our spirit man. So the power of sin has been broken in our spirit man because Jesus broke it on the cross. We no longer have a sinful nature in our inner person which is exerting its influence from inside out and hence we are no longer slaves to sin but God has set us free from the power of sin because when he was crucified on the cross our old man was also crucified a body of sin was also crucified and hence we are now a new creature a new have a new nature of the likeness and the nature of Christ in our spirit um, man okay so the work has been completed it's a present tense it's not a past tense it's a present tense spiritual reality of who we are in Christ that in Christ you know the power of sin the body of sin the dominion of sin is destroyed is done away is rendered inoperative so the believer does not have the old man or the old sinful nature in their spirit man but the believer is a new man and that is why scripture says we are uh, the new man is born again is born from above okay we read this in john chapter 3 verse 3 okay we are born from above uh, we are born of god 1 john chapter 5 verse 1 uh, we are the seed of god 1 john chapter 3 verse 9 uh, we have the nature of god 2 peter chapter 1 uh, uh, 1 verse 4 and we have the life and the zoe life and the nature of god that is 1 john chapter 5 verse 12 okay do you want to take it down? So I'm going to repeat it very slowly. So the we are born from above, John chapter 3, verse 3. We are born from above, John chapter 3, verse 3. We are born of God, 1 John 5, 1. We are born of God, 1 John 5, 1. We are born with the seed of God. We are born with the seed of God. Seed means inheritance, you know, genetic genealogy. Okay. 1 John chapter 3 verse 9. We have the nature of God. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4. We have the Zoe life and the nature of God, which is 1 John chapter 5, verse 12. 5, verse 12. We have the Zoe life and the nature of God, 1 John chapter 5, verse 12. Now, all this is not just to be in our notes. It's something that we need to declare it over our lives. Make only when we keep speaking it over our lives, when we declare it, that's when we will live in the reality of what Christ has achieved for us or purchased for us on the cross. Okay? So all of this is a reality. It's a, not something that happened in the past, the present tense reality. We can always live in this present tense reality when we can say, hey, you know, I'm not able to overcome the sin. I'm always uh, back answering. I'm always, you know, snapping at others. I'm always getting angry fast. Or, you know, I'm, um, uh, you know, have this spirit of pride and it's, I'm not able to get over it. But you need to declare who you are in Christ. You need to declare, hey, this sin has been broken, has been done away with, it's destroyed. My old man has been destroyed. It's it's rendered inoperative. You know, the power of sin over my life is broken. And I and I speak that in the name of Jesus over my life, that this power of sin is inoperative, is broken. I'm no longer a slave to this anger, to this jealousy, to this, you know, snapping back at others, to, uh, to you know, talking ill of others, to always grumbling, complaining, murmuring, all of that, because my old man is crucified. God, I want Jesus, I want to live in that new man, the new nature. And I, and, I, and I pray that I will speak things that are positive. I will stop grumbling. You know, whatever is your 
behavior you know you declare that over your life and also declare who you are in christ okay so it's very important that we speak this because the more we speak this and decree this over our lives the more we are going to it's becoming going to become a reality and we are going to live in that reality in that truth so the resurrection power of jesus helps us to gain more and more victory over sin over temptation over every other uh, 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 you know attitudes in our life also the resurrection power the power that raised jesus back from death to life that is operated in us that is in us also gives us the power to minister and to do the work of the kingdom okay how do we know this we see that after jesus resurrected he promised his disciples in acts chapter 1 verse 8 you will receive power when the holy spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses not you shall be superman superwoman batman batwoman spiderman doing all the powers you know uh, showing for those powers but you will be my witnesses witnesses means what preaching with bay commission preaching teaching baptizing following that with signs miracles and wonders in judea samaria and the ends of, of the earth excuse me sorry so here we see that the resurrection power is also made available for us the resurrection power is the power to minister to do ministry to build god's kingdom in a powerful uh, way that will impact uh, people and um, uh, the world for uh, Uh, for uh, the kingdom of god so this new intensified power you know this power that we have is called a dunamis the word power is dunamis so the same dunamis that raised jesus back from death to life is the same dunamis that is in us so dunamis you know what is a dynamite right keep if i keep a dynamite here this whole building and the other structures around us will be raised to the ground okay that is the power that is in us so we need to be also aware of the power that we have in us and not shy away and say hey if i don't pray for this person if they are not uh, well or if i don't give them a word of wisdom or knowledge of it's a wrong word of wisdom or knowledge they'll make fun of me but just say god i have that dunamis power the same power that raised you back from death to life is in in me and i want you holy spirit to manifest yourself manifest your dunamis power in and through this ministry in and through this person's um, life so this new intensified dunamis power is also for proclaiming the gospel working of miracles and overcoming every work of the enemy and it was given to the disciples uh, after christ resurrection okay after christ resurrection it was given to uh, his disciples yes we read in john chapter 20 was 21 and 22 you know when jesus suddenly appeared to the disciples and they were all in this closed uh, room with doors and windows all closed he suddenly appears to them and he breathes on them and he say receive the holy spirit but then afterwards we see in luke chapter 24 acts chapter 1 uh, acts chapter 2 jesus just before the ascension he says hey you wait in jerusalem you will be clothed with power you will the holy spirit will come upon you and you will receive power now when jesus already breathed the holy spirit on them we read this in john chapter 20 was 21 and 22 why does he say in luke chapter 24 acts chapter 1 acts chapter 2 wait in jerusalem to be clothed with power when the holy spirit comes upon you because in john chapter 20 21 and 22 when jesus breathes on them it's basically them this uh, being born again they cannot be born again till jesus died for them for their sins okay so when jesus resurrected and he came they had the born again experience and after their born again experience then he tells them you would be clothed with power so they already had the indwelling power that means in dwelling power john chapter 20 when we are born again the holy spirit comes and lives in us now they had to have the infilling power of the holy spirit which is when they will be baptized in the holy spirit and that is what happens in acts chapter 2 okay so um 
we see that the disciples receive this power to do, to preach, to teach, to do mighty signs, miracles, and wonders, and to overcome the enemy after Christ resurrected from the dead. And it was part of this new resurrection power that characterized their Christian lives. Okay. Um, Nina John says the believers who have gone on ahead and are with the Lord have a spiritual body, like Moses and Elijah at the Transfiguration, who were recognizable and had a body. The resurrected body is yet to happen for everybody, all believers, which will happen at the second coming. So those who are absent from the body already, who are gone to be with the Lord, are they present with the Lord now with a spiritual body? Yes. Uh, the spiritual body, um, yes, they have that resurrected body. So when, when Christ comes again and he takes us all, you know, those who are left behind, we will have that, um, that spiritual, uh, we will receive those spiritual bodies. And uh, they are now in paradise. Yes, so those who believe uh, are in paradise, just like, you know, when Christ died, uh, he went down to Hades. Now, just before Christ died, uh, you know, uh, before his death, Hades was is basically talking about the grave. So it had two compartments. One was uh, paradise. The other was, uh, you know, like hell. Sorry, Sheol. Yes, Sheol, hell. So all those who, you know, who like Abraham and all of those people were in paradise and all those who were not, you know, righteous before God, rejected him in hell. And when Jesus uh, died and he rose again, he, you know, uh, he took along with him, you know, captives. I think it is what Ephesians, somewhere in Ephesians, right? Uh, he took along with him, yeah. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Therefore he says, when he ascended on high, he led captive, captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? So here when he says he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. It's basically he took along with him those who were in paradise. He took along with him to, um, to heaven. Okay, so that is where uh, they are. And those who are, who are not believers and not, People who are righteous are still in um, in hell, in Hades, not the, the burning fire hell, but in a temporal place which is called uh, uh, Hades, uh, which will be the lake of burning fire hell, which they will be thrown after the great white throne uh, judgment. Yeah, but uh, just like Jesus had this glorified resurrected body, they were able to recognize him. Likewise, Moses and Elijah at the Transfiguration were also uh, recognizable. Yes, because they had that glorified resurrected uh, bodies, just like Christ. And the resurrected body is yet to happen for everybody. All of us who are still left on earth, yes, uh, we are still yet to receive that uh, resurrected uh, glorified bodies, which will happen for those of us who are left behind. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, you know, in the twinkling of the eye, we will all be raised up and we'll have these glorified bodies. Those of us who are not, you know, dead uh, at that time when Jesus comes, we will have that glorified uh, body. Yeah. So did that help uh, answer your question, Nina, John? Okay, we'll move on to Christ's resurrection. We saw that Christ's resurrection, the first one, they're looking at the doctrinal significance of Christ's resurrection. The first thing Christ's resurrection ensures our regeneration, new life, the power to overcome sin, power to do ministry. Okay, the second point is Christ's resurrection ensures our justification. Okay. So there's only one passage in the Bible, Romans chapter 4, verse 25. So can one of you please read, turn to Romans chapter 4, verse 25. And in this passage, Paul explicitly connects Christ's resurrection with our justification. Or 
Justification means we being declared not guilty, we being declared righteous before God. And so look at what Paul says in uh, uh, in, in Romans chapter 4, verse 25. Yes, Prince. Romans chapter 4, verse uh, 25. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Yes, so Paul says that he was put to death for our trespasses. We looked at you know, all the things what Christ did when he died, what and all he took upon himself. He died for us, what he did for us. And he was raised for our justification. So when Christ was raised from the dead, it was actually like I explained last week, but I'm going to explain again. When Christ was raised from the dead, it was God declaring um, his approval of Christ's work of redemption. Because Christ humbled himself and became obedient to the death, even death on a cross. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, it says, And God highly exalted him. So by raising Christ back from death to life, the Father, in effect, was saying that he approved of Christ's work of suffering, his dying for our sins. The work was completed that Christ no longer had um, had any need to remain dead. The full penalty for sin was paid once for all. The wrath of God, um, you know, was atoned for. No more wrath of God needs to be born or no one needs to bear the wrath of God anymore. There was no more guilt. There was no more punishment. All had been completely paid for and no guilt remained so uh, that or that is why Christ or God the Father resurrected Christ back from dead because when he resurrected Christ back from the dead he was saying I approve of what you have done and you find favor in my sight that is what Christ God the Father was telling God the Son you know when he rose back from the dead he was saying I approve of what you have done and you have found favor in my sight. Which means he's saying, hey, you can be resurrected now. The, the guilt has been atoned for. The payment has been made for. The wrath is no longer there. The work is completed. Everything has been done. So this explains how Paul can say in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, he was raised for our justification. He was raised for our justification, not for his justification, because he was sinless. You know, he was raised for our justification. And in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, sorry, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, where it says, God raised us up with Christ, which means that we are raised up with Christ, means we are now made righteous before God. We have a right standing before God. God looks at us just as if we have never sinned. We have been justified before God. And so because of this union with Christ, you know, spiritually we identify with Christ's death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and his exaltation because of this union with Christ. We are united with Christ in his death, in his burial, in his uh, resurrection, his ascension, his exaltation. God is declaring us also as approved because we are in union with Christ. So he's also declaring approval of us. So another beautiful thing about Christ's resurrection is that we have been justified and God approves of us. Not that we have done anything great that he approves of us. It's because Christ has been approved and has been approved and his approval of Christ's work and because we are united with Christ, so we are also being approved, which means we are also being seen as made righteous and also those who have been justified. So when the Father said to Christ, all the penalty for sins has been paid for, I find you uh, not guilty but righteous in my sight, he was thereby declaring or making this declaration that would apply to us also as those who believe in Christ, those who trust in Christ for salvation, that we have also been justified we are also being made uh, righteous. So in this way, 
Christ's righteousness, or sorry, Christ's resurrection uh, is giving us the fi final proof that we have earned our justification. If Christ was not resurrected from the dead, there will be no proof for our justification, for us being made um, uh, righteous. But, you know, Christ's resurrection gives the final proof that we have earned our righteousness, that we have earned our justification. All of you with me? All of you lost? Okay. The, the third thing is Christ's uh, resurrection ensures that we will also receive perfect resurrected bodies as well. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 was, um, uh, you know, we, we saw that Christ is the first fruits of those who have been raised up from the dead. So, it, you know, because of that, it shows that when we raise up from the dead, those who believe in him will also have resurrected bodies when we, he finally raises us up from the dead and brings us into his presence. So after Christ's resurrection, you know, he had still his nail, uh, you know, the nail prints in his hand and his feet, the mark on his side. Um, but we will not have any, like we read in John chapter 20, verse 27, but we will not have any of these scars. We will not have any injuries, wounds. We have received in this life, but we will have perfect whole uh, bodies that are imperishable, and that are glorious and spiritual bodies. Now, why did Christ have it? Because he chose to have those scars as an eternal reminder of his sufferings and his death for us. So it's going to be an eternal reminder of his suffering and death for us. Okay. Um, just another point I have is, uh, his, what is the eternal ethical significance of the resurrection what is the ethical significance of our resurrection paul sees that the resurrection has application to our obedience to god in this life so after a long discussion of resurrection that he discusses in first corinthians chapter 15 Paul concludes this in verse 58. Look at what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Can one of you please read that? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Paul concludes by encouraging his readers. What does he encourage? Therefore, my oh. beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Nina John. So it says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that the, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now, it's because Christ was raised from the dead. We too shall be raised from the dead. We sh we sh and because we too have been raised from the dead, Spiritually, we should continue steadfastly in the work of the Lord. This is because everything that we do is has eternal significance, eternal consequences, because we are bringing people from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We are building them up in the faith. We are strengthening them, nurturing them, edifying them in the faith. And all this has eternal significance because... One day we will be raised uh, when Christ returns from the dead and we shall live with him for ever. Okay. So all that we are going to do has eternal significance. So every sermon that you preach, every gospel message that you preach, everything that you teach, what gospel salvation message that you're sharing with people, you're praying has eternal significance and we need to continually be steadfast in the work of the Lord. Second thing is Paul encourages us that when we think about resurrection, to focus about the future, about our heavenly rewards. Because it says your labor in the Lord is not going to be in vain. Yes, we will go through struggles, challenges, but we need to persevere, we need to endure, we need to be steadfast. 
knowing that we will receive an eternal reward. We will receive a reward when we meet our Savior face to face. We will receive rewards from Him. Okay. Uh, we will continue with um, this, the third ethical uh, application, the next class, but we'll end here. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? Any questions, online students? Uh, Man, this is actually regarding the exam coming this week. You want to know about the exam? Yeah. Okay, that's separate okay. for the in-person. I'll answer that separately. Anyone, no questions? Okay, if there are no questions, we'll end class. We'll continue with the last bit um, next week. Thank you all for joining class. Have a good day and the rest of the week, and see you next Wednesday. Thank you.